Okay. So let's talk about all the reasons why PCR can fail. PCR should be easy. It, it's kind of like one of the easiest molecular biology things that you should do in the lab. And it should be easy. If it's not working, it means that something is like wrong, like something has been done incorrectly. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so what are, I wanna go through like a list of all the reasons why PCR can fail. So even though it's easy, it fails all the time. And my point is that it's usually easy to fix if you can kind of like track down the problem. Okay, so one of the first reasons why PCRs most often fail for, especially for new people, is it's a bad, you made like a bad mix, right? So the PCR has a tube, what are the ingredients in the tube? So you're gonna have a template. A buffer. A buffer. Um, DNTPs. DNTPs. Your primers. Primers or primer? Primers. And what? water. Primers, Wait. sorry. Primers. And then water, and then what else? This PCR reaction would fail. Oh, I mean, your, your polymerase. Wait. Template, that's the DNA is the, is the template. That you said the polymerase. It has to have a polymerase. This would work. But you get the sense that like when you mix up PCR reactions, you're mixing together six things. And so a common thing is people like set up like their workspace and they have like all their stuff, whatever, and they kind of like grab haphazardly and they maybe take one of these and then they take like one of these and then they like mix the reaction. And they're not really like sure if they did all uh, six together in the same tube. That's a very common way that PCR can fail. And it's easy to fix. The way that you fix this is like, if you have a system, you're gonna have a lab notebook, you have a recipe list, you write down your recipe list, you can put like a checkbox in your notebook beside each item. And then I will also too, I will like set my items up. Like if you had this bottle, and then that bottle, usually these are like in ice. Like I will set it up like in order. And then as I add them into my master mix, your tube, where you're mixing these reactions, uh, I'll check them off and I'll take it and then I'll move it to a different spot or put it away. And then I'll check it off and then I'll take it and I'll move it, put it to a different spot, etc. cetera. Um, another newbie mistake that can cause a bad mix is Sometimes people are really, um, maybe they're like aggressive in the lab and they like just want to get things done super fast. And so oftentimes these things are stored in the freezer, they'll be frozen and you pull them out. And so people get like, I, I don't know if it's laziness or, they, or they're just like, they just want to get it done real fast, but they don't thaw things out properly. And so they'll just thaw like a little bit of it. And then they'll so I'll say like, maybe like your template DNA or maybe like your buffer. If, if you have like a tube, like a, like, a, like a tube, and it's full of water, they'll wait and there's still like ice crystals in there and then they'll pipette out. What's the problem with doing that? You probably have like a high concentration. It's not a uniform. Yeah, this is not gonna be a uniform like mixture. And so if you are setting up a master mix of PCR, all the stuff needs to be completely thought out and then vortexed. So you usually have like a little, this little thing, it kind of looks like this, and it plugs in and it's got this like nub that like vibrates, <laughs> and you like take your tubes and you set it on the nub, maybe you guys will do some vortexing in the lab, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah there you go, okay. So you vortex these things and it mixes them up um, and, and then they're mixed. But that has, I've seen that also cause people's PCRs to fail because they're not, they're not thawing their stuff out properly. So bad mix, um, thaw stuff out, Okay. Uh, okay. Two. This would be sort of a PCR. A, 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 this would be what be a, a false positive. So you can get false positives with contamination. So every time you run a PCR, you should have some kind of like a positive control. So say you run a PCR and then you run an agarose gel, you should have both a positive and a negative control. Something where you set up a PCR reaction where you know it's gonna give you a ban, and something in a negative control reaction where you know there will not be a ban. Oftentimes people just use water for their template, 
in replace of their template for a negative control, which should not PCR. Um, and if you saw that, what would you conclude? Yeah, something, something in your mix is contaminated. So, so these are always like super key controls. Don't ever run a PCR without having a positive and a negative control. And I have had a lot of students lose a lot of time because something that they're periodically drawing from, something like water, is uh, contaminated. So water should essentially be, um, like don't, when you set up your workstation, like a good heuristic, don't have like a giant like liter bottle of water that you use for PCRs. Typically when you do run PCRs, you have a special high, um, high grade like purity molecular biology water that you specifically buy. It comes in these little tubs. And usually I will open up one of those bottles and I will set up like a tiny, like maybe like a 10 mil tube. I will pour water into that, I'll keep it closed. And then I will use this water for like a little bit but then I'll throw it away after like maybe like a month. So like don't don't keep using the same water over and over and over. Because just by opening it and putting your PCR or your pipette tips in there, it will eventually get contaminated. So that would be that would cause a false, a false positive. Um, you can also get false negatives from bad water. It, what would be the context do you think where bad water would give you a false negative? So something that should work but doesn't because of the water. The positive. What? The positive, like if it didn't have sand. Yeah, that would what it be look like. But what would be the cause of that? Like think of try to think of like the one example of what could be the cause of that. So you're right. Where if you if you ran your gel, your negative was blank, but your positive was also blank. Something in your water could have broke the PCR. So there are there that was that's actually a point a point six later down is there are we'll just say that's three there are PCR inhibitors there are like um, sometimes when you do genomic extractions from weird creatures oftentimes there's there's proteins in those samples that will inhibit PCR reactions that is always a possibility so if you have something that should be positive. It's negative. It could be an inhibitor, but what specifically, like in the water? What could there be in the water? A charge? What? A charge. A charge? Oh, sorry. Well, um, not really. Like I'm thinking, like an actual protein that would cause the reaction to fail. Oh. That's very common. Nucleus. Yeah, there could be like a nucleus. So oftentimes, water can be contaminated with DNAs. DNAs, which is a nucleus. Guess what? Guess what DNAs does. Not lysis, lysis is not, not the right word, but it cuts DNA. Lyse means like to break open cells. But these are very, very common enzymes. Every single cell on the planet has DNAs inside of it. So they're very common, they're in the air. RNAs is also another common one, although that's not gonna affect a PCR because that one's targeting RNA. But if you have nucleases in your water, that can destroy your PCR reaction for sure. Okay. Um, too much genomic DNA. So oftentimes when you set up your when you set up your PCR reaction, right, doing all your things, um, your template. This would be a variable inside of your template. So, so for example, if you're going to PCR gene from like a mosquito, you have to do a genomic extraction of DNA from that mosquito. That's going to produce what's going to be your template. Sometimes you can have so much genomic DNA that it causes the PCR reaction to not work. How, how would you explain, how, how does that mechanistically, how would that happen? Um, it would be like too much for the primers to kind of weave through to find like the super gene. Yeah, so in order for PCR to work, um, essentially like the, the primers have to find their spot. And if you have genomic DNA, you have a whole genome worth of DNA. And while your primers are probably highly specific, it might be a lot harder to find their spot to amplify, and it might slow the reaction down if you have so much genomic DNA. So having too much genomic DNA can be a problem, although this one's pretty rare. But how can you easily solve this problem? By just doing the DNA extraction instead of like a positive PCR. Wait, what? Oh. 
I was thinking, like sometimes I guess if people do like a colony of PCR, they have like too much, you know, DNA. So to solve that, they could just perform a DNA extraction. I would not redo the genomic extraction. Like you don't need to redo the genomic DNA. What do you need to do to it though? Purify it. No, well, what? Yeah. yeah, you can just dilute it. So one of the first things I will always do if, if a PCR reaction fails is in order to test whether or not it's too much genomic DNA, I'll just run a dilution series. So I'll set up like maybe like three tubes that are exactly the same PCR, except in this one, the template is one X in this, in this one, the template is a tenfold dilution, one over 10. So it'd be like you take one microliter and mix it with uh, nine microliters of water and then pull one from that. And then ditto here, this would be like one out of a hundred. And I've gone all the way, like PCR is so sensitive. You can do dilutions down to like one in a million and it will still be positive. So it's like, I have seen too much genomic DNA cause things to fail. And so I would run a dilution series if it does fail and just set up the same PCR reaction with a few separate dilutions. Is there a way to calculate it prior to it failing? Calculate a what? Like to quantify the amount of template that's in there prior to it failing? Some people will do that. So some people will do like, um, you can quantify the DNA you have, like a nano drop. Like you can do, you can quantify DNA. Um, so nanodrops just this little machine, you like open it up, you put like a drop and it will tell you how much DNA is in there. Some people do that. I always feel like that is, I don't know, like it's, <laughs> maybe it's not a waste of time, but I always feel like it's, I always feel like it's kind of a waste of time. Like PCR, I'm saying, I'm telling you, PCR is easy. Like I, I never do weird stuff or add things into PCR unless it fails. Like if it failed, then it might be worth to, worthwhile going back, like looking at your genomic DNA, checking with nanodrop, et cetera. But uh, essentially like do that when you discover a problem, not like every time you do a PCR is my point. Does that make sense? Okay, so in contrast to the too much, too little, if you're extracting DNA from some like really weird specimen, you don't have very much of it, oftentimes you might not get enough. Although this, again, PCR is so sensitive that even the tiniest amount, um, you can typically amplify, but having too little could be a problem. And in this case, how do you fix that? In this case, you can't just do a dilution, right? So how, how do you fix too little? The only way is to repeat the genomic extraction. So in this case, you would have to do like a repeat. And when you're doing science, if something like this was a problem, you would try to upscale by like a factor of 10. Like don't, 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 if, if one X of whatever you did in the first place was too little, don't think that doubling it is gonna cause any difference. Like try to look for like a scale of 10. Could you go back through like one of the kits? Like if I did a mini prep and it, I had way too little in there or I diluted it too much, could I go back through a mini prep kit and dilute it with less water at the final step? Yes, but saying? although like you are never gonna have an issue with too little DNA if your template is a plasma from a mini prep. That will never be an issue because plasmids are gonna replicate at like high copy number. So that's never gonna be an issue. I have seen it before with like genomic stuff though. Everybody understands the difference between PCR and off a like, genomic DNA versus plasma DNA, right? Like how those are different? <laughs> yes, no? Is it like you understand that there's a difference between genomic and plasma? That's what I'm saying, yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, Bad primers. This is oftentimes, like this is why we're doing assignments on primer design. This is probably the, probably the number one thing for why, number, that's the number one. <laughs> Actually, yeah. This is probably like the number one reason why, in my experience, my PCRs probably fail. It's probably, it, you just, sometimes you just get unlucky, you get bad primer design. Or not unlucky, but there's ways, there's ways to fix this. So like, let me give some examples of, let me give some examples of bad primer design. So I'm gonna erase all these and I'm gonna move that up. Okay, and this is where actually like talking about the, some of the stuff I saw in the assignment is, is a good idea. So with, there's kind of this heuristic that I described um, 
your, your temperatures of your, your annealing temperatures or primers should be about 56 to 60. It's not like a hard cutoff rule. Like you can use primers that are less and they're actually cases of where you might want to do that. And you can use primers that are a little hotter in terms of annealing. But if you're just doing like a standard PCR, like just try to stay in this range, okay? Um, what's like, and let's actually think about why. Like what happens to primers that are less than, less than 56? What's, what's their problem? So what's happening to a primer that's, that's colder annealing in comparison to one that's hotter? So let's say colder anneal primer versus hot anneal. So this would be like 55 versus 61. What's actually the difference? Um, we need like Not you. What's actually the difference, Deborah, between a colder and a hot annealing temperature primer? Um, it has to do with the bonds. So I guess yeah. if you had a colder one, you could have issues with actually uh, breaking the C and D bonds. Whoa, whoa, wait, before you get to that, so, so you said it's the bonds. Yeah. Are there less or more, so it's the hydrogen bonds you're talking about. Less bonds or more bonds? There's less bonds. There's less bonds, which means essentially that the primer is shorter, right? Do we agree? I mean, there's some, there's like GC content, AT content as well, but essentially like primers that are annealing at colder temperatures are typically like short. What's gonna happen with shorter primers? Can you think of any problems with having like a, a primer that's too short? No, they'll still, like, they'll still, like, well, when you say get the sequence that you want, in theory, you are, have always designed them to get the sequence that you want. So I guess I don't quite understand what you're saying there. But they're, all, like, I'm trying to, I don't want to give away the answer. Um, okay, say you have, say you have A. Say you had, a, say you had, this is a ridiculous example, but say you had a primer that was literally an A. How many binding spots in a genome are there for A? Oh, there would just be so many binding spots. Though. Yes, so the shorter a primer is, that's that means that there's more binding spots. And there even might only be like exactly one of those sequences, but you have to understand that, again, like these bonds and these annealing are flexible and they might find sequences that are kind of like that binding spot. And so there's some flexibility here where if the primer's too short, they're not gonna have high specificity. So primers that are longer, primers that are longer, do they have higher specificity or lower specificity? Higher. They have higher specificity. Higher specificity. But what's the problem with, with making primers, like why don't we just make primers that are like infinitely long, like, like super long? If you want, if you, if you want, I, I don't want to put you on the spot. To reuse it and maybe something happened and uh, the DNA changed by it, there's like one base pair that you could reuse again. I think that's going to be unlikely because if you're if you're doing a PCR, typically like you kind of, you, you typically are running it like once. But you're right, like there could be some there could be some mismatches if you designed it from say. But that's not that's not the thing I typically worry about. Is anybody from the assignment, can you think of anything? Yeah, or would, would you view that, like, would it cause more, like, likeability for inheritance and stuff? Yes, okay, so the problem with getting things longer is you start to create scenarios where the primer can do weird structural things. So you can form a hairpin, where if in the sequence you had an A, 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 and up here you had a T, 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 that's gonna create a hairpin, okay? And, Mechanistically, hairpins will destroy a PCR reaction because this is essentially a primer priming itself. And the DNA polymerase can see this as like a primer and it can come and extend on this and that can destroy your PCR reactions. So that's one case. So hairpins, what's the other issue with longer and longer primers? It's similar to the hairpins, but a different molecular mechanism. You checked it in the illegal calc. So 
You can have primer dimers. What's a primer dimer? If say you had two really, really long primers, there might be spots where they can, there might be spots where they can anneal to themselves. So this is like a hairpin, but it's a, it's a complex of annealing between your forward and your reverse primer instead. And they do the same thing. The polymerase can like read and write this instead of your amplicon. Does that make sense? So these are, these are issues with long primers. These are issues with short primers. And so in general, like, um, you want, you, you, you kind of, it's like a, what's the, the Goldilocks? Or is that, yeah, that's that. She wants it like not too hot, not too cold. Like you want it like <laughs> in the spot, in the zone. Um, because of this reason. So it's worth also talking about how, if in, there are some situations where you have to have long primers, like you don't have a choice. Like when we do cloning stuff, we have to build kind of these long primers. And so there are fixes, there are like technical fixes to fixing hairpins and um, primer dimers. So the technical fix is called uh, hot start PCR. So let me explain this. So a hot start PCR is where you mix up your tube with all your reagents, except you do not add the polymerase. You don't add the polymerase yet. And the reason you don't is because, again, imagine if you have a situation where you have a hairpin. You don't want to add the polymerase to that tube as you're mixing up because it can immediately start like writing at and destroy a reaction. So you wait to add the polymerase, okay? You set up your reaction, so one, set up reaction minus polymerase. Two, put it in the thermocycler. And when you run your program, what do your programs look like? What's the first thing that happens? What are the three steps? You appeal. What? What's the first step? Oh, so that's typically in the loop, the first step is denature. So I'll just write out what the program for a hot start would look like. In the loop, the first step is denature, then it's anneal, then it's what? Extension. Extension. Denature, what are denature temperatures? 98. Annealing, 55 to 60, 56 to 60, I should correct it. Oh, that was, I was doing a call, that's why. 56 to 60, depending on your primer. Extension is at 72. This is the loop, but that's not the whole reaction. So this loops 35 times. But actually, when you start the reaction, there's what's called an initial denature, which is usually 98 degrees Celsius, two minutes. They call this the initial denature. And the way that you do hot start is you put your tube in the thermocycler and you let the program run the 98 degrees Celsius initial denature and you set it to do an extra step where it just sits at 85 degrees Celsius for like one minute. And when it cools down to the 85, after the initial denature, you pause the program. You can literally press pause. You open it up and then you add your polymerase to the sample. And then you just put it back in and just press continually go, and that will fix the problem. Why will that fix the problem? Because the initial Wait, somebody else. Why will that fix the problem? It will like make it more likely that the primer will bind to the DNA to itself. Yes, because if, it, yes, exactly. Because when you set it up, if you, um, if this is what it looks like when it's cold, when you're setting up your reaction, if you're getting these hairpins or primer dimers, as soon as you put it in the thermocycler and you heat it to 98 degrees Celsius, what happens to this? You heat up the bonds and what happens? It, this will denature as well. So this is gonna denature like your primer. So then you no longer have your hairpin. So the heat will denature your hairpin and then when you add your polymerase at 85, you're adding your polymerase right when the primer is like about to anneal to its, its thing. So a hot start, 
it's a very, very simple modification. It's, it's literally, it's nothing special. It's literally, you're just like adapting when you're adding the polymerase and how you're setting up your program. Um, and that like nine out of 10 times can fix primer issues. Like that's a huge fix. Got it? Okay. Um, another thing that will cause, so this is still within bad primers. Another thing that will cause uh, reactions to fail, and I did doc, I think I docked a few people like minus one point for this, is if you're picking, like you can have a primer that's 55 or you can have a primer that's 61, but you start to encounter problems when you're starting to pair primers that aren't similar annealing temperatures. So again, like the reason you shoot for this range is because then they're kind of like paired. So you don't want one primer, you don't want like your forward primer annealing at 55 and your reverse primer annealing at like 61. That's a big difference in when they're annealing. And so essentially like if you have a situation like this, you have like there, there are clever ways to get around it, but you have to pick uh, an annealing temperature to set the thermocycler to. So if you set the annealing to favor this primer, then this primer is not being very efficient. If you set it to this one, then this one's not being very efficient. So like you're typically splitting the difference or in a best case scenario, you're actually specifically designing primers that are exactly the same, which is actually really easy given the fact that you typically have infinite control, not infinite, but you have control over where you're putting your actual primers to bond. So there isn't really an excuse to sort of design them poorly so that they don't work together. Um, okay. Oh, okay. So another, another reason PCRs can fail. So this would be seven is your annealing temps were like predicted wrong. Right? Like we use this like algorithm and the algorithm, all it does is it's just like looking at the A's, T's, G's, C's, and it's calculating how many hydrogen bonds there are. And there's a specific exact energy input that it takes to break one of those hydrogen bonds. And so the algorithm is literally just like summing up um, that information. But sometimes there's some variation there, like maybe you'll have some weird structural thing, or maybe there's something going on that we don't quite know at the molecular level that can affect the annealing temperature. And so when you set up a PCR with two primers, and the algorithm predicted they were at 56, and you run it at 56, and it doesn't work. Sometimes it's just because like the annealing temperature you predicted was wrong. So how would you, this is an easy fix too, how would you fix this? Like it's not that your primers won't work, it's that the annealing temperature you chose was incorrect. What's the fix? Upgrades. What? A gradient PCR. Yeah, so you can do this thing called a gradient PCR. Okay, so a gradient PCR is when, here's the thermocycler. The thermocycler has this heated block with these, it's a metal block with these like rows of places where you can put the tubes. Okay. 